Well, hello. I want to welcome you to my very first Q and A. Uh, I'm going to be. I've been collecting questions for a while. You know, at first it was unintentional. After a while, it became intentional. I even started soliciting questions. And what this is about is questions that have come from viewers in comments or in private messages about fountain pens and fountain pen related topics. So if videos about pens and inks and both new and old uh, paper that goes with them interest you, please subscribe below. If you would like to comment on anything that was said, or if you have a, a, an additional question or would like more information, please feel free to comment about that below. So I hope uh, this interests you. Uh, right now, I've, I've just come off a very cold week. What you see behind me was the view outside my back door one day this week. Uh, later, uh, I it didn't get much better, so I decided, hey, let's run Needles Highway behind me. So this is Needles Highway in the fall down in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So I'll use that for my background for most of this video. So I collected most of my uh, questions into this notebook, which is a cognitive surplus notebook. And we'll see how this goes. So the first question was about the terms everyday carry versus everyday writer. Well, my everyday carry is in this Lit Labs pen foldy thingy. Uh, everyday carry is what do you carry with you every day? I carry my keys. Uh, I carry a pen with me to write. I carry this. Um, usually my laptop com comes with me. Do you carry your wallet? Do you carry a comb? Do you carry a knife? You know, all those kind of things. Um, everyday writer is more specific to what do you write with all the time. That would be my Lamy 2000 fine point with Lamy black ink now. Uh, everyday carry in the pen world might be, I always like to have a pen with a color and nib appropriate for correcting student work. I like to have a stub or really broad nib for that kind of writing when needed. Uh, I like to have a couple different colors just for highlighting or emphasis purposes. Uh, that's my everyday carry. Now there's no hard and fast rule about which pens that will be, just that it's there. I always carry this uh, Visconti ink pot with me. It's full of Lamy Black. Uh, I always carry one ballpoint with me. It's a freebie I got in the mail. And then just whatever and the Lamy 2000. Now everyday writer during the school year is the Lamy 2000. In the summer I branch out. Generally, if I leave the house, especially if I'm not dressed up, I'll just pop a Caveco Sport into my pocket. I suppose that's my everyday writer. Not that I'm expecting to do much writing, but if I have to, there it is. Uh, I'll also, the pen I'm writing with regularly will change. It'll more often be the Pilot Custom 823 or maybe one of the vintage pens that doesn't see as much action during the school year. Uh, that's that's what I use in the summer because I'm at home more and not in a shall we say slightly more risky environment. Uh, the everyday writer is just what are you comfortable with out of what you have. I'm comfortable with my Lamy 2000. Yes, I really like the Pilot Custom 823, but I like the the writing with this Lamy 2000 better. So there it is. That's how I pick my everyday carry and my everyday writer. Uh, but I will say there's no hard and fast definition of those terms. So make of that what you will. Uh, my next question was about safety pens. And this came, of course, because I've had a Boston safety pen. This is a Noodler's pen. I am laying an eyedropper beside it for a very good reason, because it was included in the package. Uh, some of the questions were, what is a safety pen? Well, I think part of the answer is going to come from how do you fill a safety pen, which was another question I was asked. So a safety pen is an eyedropper. And you fill it with the nib retracted. Uh, according to Noodlers, it takes about one and a half of these pipettes full of ink to fill the thing. And you just fill it right there where the nib comes out. Now, to look at it, you might say, what's the difference between this and any other retractable nib? Well, I'll tell you. In any other retractable nib, the nib is retractable, and that's that. 
in a safety pen, when it retracts, you remember where I filled it? It actually sits in the reservoir of ink. It is constantly bathed in the ink. Uh, a common pitfall with safety pens, and I've only done it once, is to do this. And out comes the ink. You always have to keep it nib up unless the nib is extended fully. Uh, when capped, there is a mechanism inside the cap, which when I review this pen, I will have to make sure I show you. I'll have to figure out how to light it. That uh, once it's like this, you know, you can go nuts. But right now, danger, safe. Uh, you might say, well, what's the advantage of a pen like that? And the, the main advantage is, with fountain pens, you're limited to certain types of ink because of the danger that will clog up the feed. For example, you don't use India ink or any kind of ink that has a suspended matter in it. Although there are some fountain pen safe pigmented inks now, um, such as the ones by Platinum or Sailor. But for the most part, you don't dare use them because they will clog up your fountain pen. Well, when the nib is constantly bathed in ink, that's not so much of an issue. The only real thing you have to worry about is don't use a solvent in the ink that will eat pen parts. So if it eats ebonite or it eats stainless steel or it eats any of the seals, don't use it. But other than that, go nuts. That's the advantage of a safety pen. I think a safety pen is probably more of interest to an artist than a regular writer, except as a curiosity, which is why I bought it. Okay. Now my next question was about how I organize pens. So let me tell you. I review about one pen a week. I, lately, I've slowed down a little because I've been revisiting certain pens. Um, but I review about one pen a week. Now, that could add up to 52 pens a year. Uh, I will say I don't have that many pens because I give them away. I uh, was going to do a count for this video, but I forgot. So I don't have all the pens here downstairs where I'm at. And uh, some of them are laying on the sink to be clean because I got behind on that during this busy spell. Uh, some of them are just floating around the house for various reasons. I organize my keeper pens, make sure it's just showing up, into two main pen portfolios. I'm not going to show you every single pen. One of these days down the road when I'm more ready, I will do a proper pen tour. Um, one pitfall of my storage method, this Rutschen Core uh, does not fit into these either portfolio, but, you know, they are... Uh, Nicely organized, neatly kept. The empty spaces, uh, about three quarters of them actually should have a pen in them, then just don't. Yes, there are some empty spots in my collection waiting for a new friend. So, the way I organize within them, uh, let's look, for example, at my platinums, what such as are in here. Uh, two platinums are out. So, you know, this isn't quite the full, full experience, but anyway, the Platinum President is out, and uh, I forget what the other Platinum is that's out, but there's two that are out. Anyway, I just organize them by brand. There's all my Platinums. What's here? Here's my Waterman's Pens. Uh, Senator. Some, several, two of them are out for cleaning. Uh, Pelican. Uh, Several out for cleaning and an empty spot. And then I've got my oddballs. I have a Reform, an East German Marquant, a Majestic. Now my Aurora collection, except for the style, is all here right now. My Cavecos. I can't remember if there's a pen goes here or not, or where you can't see. Oddball, Arrow. Um, my Parker collection's a little low right now, and I feel like there's something else goes here. I'll know when I start slipping all the pens back in. My Sailors and so on. Visconti. I only actually have one Visconti. One Monte Grappa, One Omas. Now that I think about it, my screen, <laughs> my title screen, because I had to make a new title screen for this. I had my Parkers out to make the title screen, so they're laying over there. So I need to put them back in. Uh, the other portfolio. Uh, let's see here. The... Rotrink has to sit here because he doesn't fit in either pen case. Noodlers, several of them are out for cleaning or use. Uh, my Pilots, there is an empty space in there somewhere. 
my Lamis. My Daily Writer goes here. There's another Lamy that's out right now that's cleaned. I just need to put it back. Esther Books, my Shrade Tactical Pen. Uh, Schaefer's Oddball. This is a crocodile pen that I really like. Another Oddball. It's a Rexall. I need to review one of these days. Um, Mont Blanc, which now I need to make room for a friend because I have another Mont Blanc. Uh, both vintage. This is a, what is this one? A Swan Maybe Todd. A unique Japanese pen. A Retro Tornado 51. Conklin Two Ponds from Norway. A what I believe is Phoenix. It's a Dutch pen. A Cora. Also a Dutch pen. I uh, can't remember if a pen goes here or not. Two Chinese pens from different makes. Or no. These are both Ling Mo's. Bauer 801. Uh, and I'm going to call it my Soviet collection, which is growing. You may look at this and say, no, it's not. But you don't see them all because they're part of what's in progress. I have an additional portfolio. It was meant to be just pens I planned to review. But uh, I think I'm going to have to expand into it soon. I have a Jin Hao, Caveco, and other Arrow, which I don't care for. Parker Jotter. Some more vintage Parkers. A vintage... No, what is this? A Pelican Stola. Uh, this is some kind of wing song, but I don't remember right now what. Some Indian pens. A Lamy Safari knockoff. Darned if I remember what this is. Oh, this is one that... These are two pens that need some repair work. Another Indian pen... This is an in... Oh, boy. Actually, I do know what this is. It's just escaping me at the moment. A Selector 123, which is a Dutch, uh, Netherlands manufacturer. And... Damned if I remember what the hell this is. <laughs> it's a pen of some kind. Uh, never reviewed with it. Never wrote with it. I need to clean it before I dare to write with it. Might be one of my exotic Soviet pens, but I feel like it's not. I feel like it's a Chinese pen. But, I'll figure it out before I film a review. And it's possible the pen may be so awful I never film a review of it. Uh, this is actually my favorite looking case. It just doesn't have as many pens in it. and doesn't hold as many. So, yeah, I organize by brand. Within that, I try and keep like with like. But uh, part of it is just, oh, do I have a tall pen on the row below? Oh, I better put a short pen up here. So, uh, yeah, as long as they're by brand and I keep it small enough that I don't have too much to remember. Uh, I feel if I ever buy a giant case for my pens, maybe I've gotten too many. So, yeah, that's how I organize. Uh, other people I just wrote here. Some people like to use drawers. Uh, Chris Rat 52 has a nice video where he shows some custom drawers and then some inserts he used in them for his collection. Uh, there are nice, nice, nice display cases. If I ever get rich, I'm going to build a custom bookshelf in my living room along the wall that actually is right above my head. Um, and, and it, of course, it's going to have a lot of books in it, but it's also going to have a display case for my slide rules and a nice fountain pen display case, somehow UV protected. Um, other people might use color, similar features. I, I watched, you probably did too, Brian Goulet did a tour of his new facility. And he showed his pen storage case and it's kind of drool worthy. And at the same time you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of, for example, Lamy Safaris. So, uh, you know, I don't ever want a collection that big, but I'm not in the pen selling business. I, I buy pens that interest me and I keep the ones I like. And I have been open to trading in the past. I have sold a few, and I've given a lot away. Uh, another question I had was the obvious, well, what about organizing inks? I'll just be honest, I don't. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to have to do an ink tour one of these days, but what I have, I have a nice, it's an old chemistry box. Uh, I have a lot of inks in there. I guess kind of my favorites, but not all my favorites. It was originally supposed to be just my favorites, but that's branched out. On the shelf below it, I have pen inks that are in boxes, and behind them a few more inks. And then in my bedroom, I have a drawer full of ink. I have a lot of ink. Uh, 
Now, when you look behind somebody like Matt Armstrong, he obviously has them all organized by brand. I know other people will organize them by color. Um, some organize them by name, although name doesn't necessarily signify color, so I'm not so much a fan of that. But uh, you know, the big thing is what works for you to help you find and keep track of what you have. And same for pens. Maybe you want all your red pens together. Maybe you want all your vintage pens together. Maybe you want all your flex pens together. You know, there, there's lots of different ways. You just have to find a way that makes sense to you, which sounds like I'm straddling the fence, but that's kind of how it is. All right, I had uh, some other questions about the writing side of this. So I held up this lovely cognitive surplus notebook. Uh, I like them. They come with science-themed hard covers, science and math themed. I have one that's neurons. I have... I don't know, a spacey one. I've got, uh, anyway, there was one I had that said cephalopods on it. Very nice. I, I'm very much liking this, and I kind of like, depending on the notebook, you may find blank page facing lined page. Uh, others have graph page facing lined page. Uh, I, I was looking at uh, code and quill notebooks. Those have dot pad and uh, lined page. Uh, my Uber Pence has nice, I think it's dot pad. I don't. I only own one, and it was a prototype at the time. Um, let's see what else do I have over here. Hmm. Of course, I do my pens in use in an Apica notebook. It's a um, very nice paper. Well, I apologize for the disruption there, or if I jumped a little, I uh, battery on that camera ran out. <laughs> Forgot to check them. Luckily, I had a second one charged. So uh, I think I was talking. I have the Apica that I use for my writing samples when I do my pen reviews. Uh, very nice paper. Honestly, too nice for anything I do. So that's about all I do with it. I have a... I don't remember the brand. I think this is either a Life or a Subami Fools. I'll figure it out before I review it. Uh, where I just keep track of what pen and ink as I ink them up. Very simple, very straightforward. That's my latest Montblanc that I mentioned, and a Moster Pencala. So, yeah. And then I have a notebook I keep my quotes in. Again, either Life or Tsubami Fools. I can't remember which one's which. This is where I write down quotes as I run across them. And, of course, I have to keep track when I use them so I don't recycle them. But then this is uh, another notebook. Uh, as far as others... I like the Kakuyo Campus Notebooks for my novel writing. And I like the Midori Bullet Journal as uh, kind of my planner, bullet journal. I'm sorry, Midori Traveler's Notebook as my bullet journal, planner, calendar, and just a random on-the-go notebook. So I'll have to show you how I set that up one of these days, but not today. Also a very soon upcoming review my BOMO art journal, which is what I use for pens in use now. And it, I think it's done very well for that. I'm past the halfway point. So those are the few notebooks I use. I'm not really a journaler properly. I don't sit and record my thoughts and my feelings. I just never been good at that. You know, as a kid, I tried doing a diary and stuff, and just, it's not me. All right, fiction. Uh, I'll write lists, I'll write down research, I'll organize ideas, but that whole feelings and thoughts, meh. <laughs> Never got into it. All right, I had a question about how I carry pens. And I think there were two layers to the question. Because one of the, que one of the questions, as I recall, was about the fact that I mentioned I live in North Dakota and I walk to work. So first of all, if I have a shirt with a pocket, usually I have my Lamy 2000 there. I, uh, that's where I keep my daily writer. Now, if I'm wearing a shirt without a pocket, which is basically in the summer, then I usually put my Caveco Sport in my pocket, my pants pocket or shorts pocket, whatever it is I'm wearing. And, uh, other than that, I use what I showed you before, this Lihit Labs. It's what I keep a lot of my pens in when I travel. I do have a smaller pen carry thing 
that leather that I didn't bring down, but uh, sometimes if I'm going for a weekend meeting and I just need two or three pens, that's what I'll put them in. So uh, that's what I carry them in. Now, uh, not as careful as some people. You know, I, I try not to have them banging around loose, but at the same time, they're not you know, securely in their own individual little case or anything. Um, now, I think the cold weather thing came in, and I have a separate category here about cold weather. Uh, how do they survive the cold weather? Well, when I walk to work, they're in the case. They're also inside of another case where I carry my papers that I'm correcting and all that. Now, it's not a hard case. It's just a soft case. It's a little, me it's, well, not that little, but a messenger bag. I keep my laptop in it as well. And that seems to be enough insulation for my walk to work, even on the coldest of days. Now, would I leave my fountain pen out overnight in the cold? No, it would freeze. I've never tried it to find out how bad that is, and uh, my feeling is it's probably not good. Um, as far as ink goes, I don't order ink in the winter. You know, it's going to be minus 11 tonight. That's Fahrenheit. I forget what that is in Celsius. No, <laughs> not ordering ink. Uh, it'll freeze. You know, they may say that the trucks are heated, uh, but I have had things show up with ice floating in them before. So, not going to do that with fountain pen ink and glass bottles. All right, so just don't buy ink in the winter, but it's not something I worry too much about. I did experiment once with Noodler's Polar inks. Uh, I stuffed a sample of it into my freezer. It froze. So... I guess I don't know enough about Noodler's Polar Inks to make an intelligent comment if that was a bad one or if it's just not meant to be used that way. I don't know. Okay, now another question that comes up fairly often. Well, I shouldn't say fairly often. Another question that comes up from time to time is, could you review X pen or X notebook or X ink or whatever? And the answer is, maybe, if it strikes my fancy. Uh, I, I don't have any sponsors. No retailer helps me in any way. No retailer sends me any samples. I do not get any of the manufacturers sending me samples to try. I get none of that. Anything I review, I have purchased or it's been a gift from somebody. Or I've traded for it. Um, I, I did have one bad experience and, I won't, and I, I'm really hesitant to get into doing that again. Um, basically what I do is I review what interests me. So if you suggest something that interests me anyway, why not? Uh, if you suggest something that really I'm not interested in, oh, did you see that Lamy Safari has come out with a new color? Don't care. I've got a Lamy Safari, reviewed it. Probably will do a re-review at some point of the same pen. Don't need another one. And, it, um, and of course I'm on a budget. No, I don't have any desire to go into debt. So if it's coming out of my own pocket, I have to pay for it and justify it and budget for it. So I'd rather spend money on stuff that interests me. I, uh, I do try to hit all ranges. Now, it is fun to try a new pen, even if it's a cheap little 99 cent Jinhao 992. I really was impressed with that pen. But it struck my fancy on another reviewer's channel. So uh, that's pretty much how I pick my pens. I just, what, what interests me? Do I see something that interests me? Am I saving for something that interests me more? Uh, that whole time I was saving for that Aurora, I didn't order any pens. Um, and I'll tell you one of the things I love are the lesser known vintage pens like Senator, Cora, Selector, Arrow, Phenol, or no, Penol, sorry, Phenol's a preservative you put in fountain pen ink. Penol, um, th those kind of manufacturers, those are what interest me. That's my passion. I'm really enjoying, like, when I run across an, uh, a Central European make, like Centro Pen, or Garant, or Marcant. Um, I just discovered a new one, Isco. That, that's interesting to me. It's doesn't have a lot of interest out there, which is probably part of the reason I will always remain a small channel. I just don't review pens people want to see. All right, so uh, on that topic, what about those lesser-known vintage pens? That 
was a source of a lot of questions. Um, for example, where do I find them? Well, I find them all over. Uh, when I first started discovering them, the first few I found on myuberpens.com, which is a very nice vintage retailer. Uh, they sell fully restored pens, and you will run across pens that maybe you won't see at other, vin other retailers. Uh, because they're based, I believe, in either Macedonia or Croatia. Right at the moment, it's not coming to me which one. But uh, that's where I got my central pen, which is now a pen that's open for question whether it really is a central pen or not, but I still love it. Um, as I branched out, of course, the obvious, Peyton Street, that's where I got the two Schaefers that showed up in my pens and use last week. Now, admittedly, I bought them like a year or two ago, but you know, that's where they came from. Um, eBay, of course, is a very good one. You can find just about anything on eBay. Uh, you can find some that are restored, some that are not. And I, I've bought both. Uh, Etsy.com, that's a lot of crafts and stuff, but you'll also find vintage fountain pens. I've seen, I haven't purchased one, <laughs> but I saw a Yugoslavian rotary dial phone for sale from a retailer I bought another pen from. Um, just, I, I think if you look around at your local antique stores, you may find some interesting pens, especially if you're not looking for those mainline brands. Uh, if you're in the United States, you'll find some of the lesser known U.S. manufacturers like Rexall or Monogram or, uh, I don't know, Majestic or some of them. Uh, if you, it won't, you probably won't find a vintage, I don't know, Marcant from East Germany, but hey, you never know. I've run into some, some surprises in antique stores. Uh, where I live now, it's a bit of a problem because... I'm just such a rural location so far from anywhere. I don't get to stores very often, so I'm pretty much reduced to online for my fountain pens. Um, how do I know so much? <laughs> well, the truth is I really don't. I've educated myself. I look online. I've watched videos. I've read a lot. I actually found this again online because good luck finding a bookstore in southwestern North Dakota. Uh, but I bought, I saw this for sale for about $50. It's a used copy, of course. Uh, usually even the used ones aren't that cheap. So when I saw it that cheap, I uh, hadn't budgeted for it, but I jumped on it. That's why I have extra money from time to time. You just see those things that you're just like, yes! And there it was. I was a little disappointed in the book because it, it does mention a lot of the less well-known manufacturers. Like... The word Cora appears in their Netherlands section. So I know Cora was a legitimate manufacturer in the Netherlands, but I know nothing about them. There's a paragraph about Selector. There's a little bit about Senator. I was actually hoping I'd get help from this book about identifying all the senators. So, you know, fountain pens of the world. Un Andreas Lambro. Um... He has a section on Japan in the back. Italy, we might as well just forget anything east of the Iron Curtain existed. Nothing about Garant, nothing about Silka, or I'm sorry, Silka's a model. Nothing about Centropan, nothing about Isco, nothing about those. And nothing about uh, Penal, Pond from Norway, none of them are in there. So yes, it's very comprehensive, but there is a lot missing. Richard Binder's website is a very good source. But again, things are missing from there too. I can't identify my senators from that website. So uh, I, I'll tell you another good source has been uh, Granmia Pens. He has videos on a lot of diverse vintage fountain pens and a lot of videos about various restoration techniques, which that is a very useful resource and... Uh, no, I hope that stays around. So, and just don't be afraid to research and read and, of course, watch out for reputable websites. And that's where I would mention a lot of what you're going to find isn't so much academic research as it is, I've tried this, or is this as near as I can tell from what I heard from this person who heard it from this person, it's not the same as doing scientific research when you're learning about fountain pens. And I've gotten some bad advice 
frankly. And hopefully I haven't given any, but I'm sure I will at some point. Uh, you have to be willing to be wrong. And it's worse for me because every time I'm wrong, it's on record. Somebody comments on it and they say, well, how can you call yourself a reviewer if you don't know this? Well, not everybody says that, but occasionally you get that comment. And I'll just say, yeah, you have to be open to making a mistake and own it when you make one. Hopefully nobody gets hurt. And always, of course, always be open to learning. I don't watch other reviewers to look, well, I do look for techniques and things, but partly it's to learn about pens. That's a big part of it. I just want to learn what's out there, different filling mechanisms and so on. Uh, that's why I enjoy Grand Miao pens, because I see some interesting vintage pens I just didn't know existed. Uh, hopefully I'm doing that for somebody. Of course, be a voracious reader of anything. Yes, pen books like the one I held up are a good resource. Pen websites are a good resource. But so is something as simple as knowing a little bit of history. You start to put things together. You start to put things in context. You start to say, oh, that country existed then, but it didn't later, and now it does again, in the case of Croatia. Um, you, you, uh, you really learn a lot just by reading anything. History, uh, politics, science. There's just so much out there. You might think, well, that doesn't help me with my fountain pen journey. Well, yeah, it does. Just maybe not the way you expected it to. Um, I'll be honest. There's, I still know very little about some brands, like the Senators. I've heard Merce and Krell, but again, not helping me identify my pens. Um, and of course, you'll see my successes. And let's just be honest. For many of these pens, not much is known. So what little I do know and can share is better than what was out there before. You know, when I explored the Norwegian Pond brand, you know, some people thought I was talking about, where was it, Denmark? Anyway, there's another pond on the main continent of Europe. I don't remember where. I never have owned one of their pens. But uh, a lot of people thought I was talking about them. And No, I was talking about the Norwegian pen. And uh, so... I was able to supply some information to people. Now, I found it on the internet. I put it together. Uh, there wasn't much. I had to use Google Translate because I don't speak any Norwegian. But, you know, it was, uh, I put it in one place for the help of others. And uh, that's actually one of the reasons I put my uh, citations below. You won't see any citations in this video, but it's a different sort of video. But the reason I put citations Maybe those same references can help other people. Now, the nature of the internet, sometimes they disappear or change their URL, and that's just life, and I'm sorry. But uh, that's one of the reasons I do it. And another reason is so you can fact check me. I got fact checked in my Wingsung 601. Turns out it really is a vacuumatic, just like a Parker vacuumatic. I thought it was a draw filler. Turns out I was confusing pens in my brain. So those things happen. Um, and Unlike me just being wrong and not knowing it, I got called on it, which is good, because now I know. I won't say that again. Um, but I will say, when you do like I do and you talk about lesser-known pens, like the Garant and the Marcant and the Centro Pen, you know, outside their area, of course, you are authoritative just because you put something out there. So that's how I can end up sounding authoritative. A lot of what you'll see about the pen is opinion, of course. Um, manufacturing methods, filling methods, a lot of them are pretty universal. So, you know, you just learn about them along the way. And I will just say, the more you know, the more you, first of all, the more you realize you don't know. But second of all, the more you see, oh, these are questions I have to ask. This is a hole in my knowledge where you didn't even know there was a hole there before. Um... And you have more general knowledge to connect things. You know, what I learned about button fillers from the pond, later on I got a Parker Dual Fold, which showed up in the title screen, where the button filler didn't work. Thanks to the Pond 52, I knew what a button filler was, and I got an idea how to fix it. So, uh, 
yeah, just educate yourself the more you educate yourself. I know it sounds trite, but the more you educate yourself, the more you know. Uh, I've been asked about my handwriting style. Now, in elementary school, of course, here in the United States, we learn usually block printing first. And then in second grade, they start introducing cursive, even though actually from what I have read, small children are better at curved shapes, so maybe we should be teaching cursive first. But nowadays, there are schools not teaching cursive at all, so whatever. Uh, I'm not going to do an editorial on that right now, but I will tell you my own experience in cursive, I absolutely hated handwriting class. Hated it. It was mind-numbing, it was boring. I hate the act of copying letters and copying shapes. Still hate it. That's been one of my obstacles to learning the Chinese language. I hate just copying. Now, I used to have a bad grip. I'll put it under the camera here with my another senator whose model I don't know. You're supposed to hold with what they call a tripod grip like this. Well, up until my mid-30s, I held with a quad pod grip like that. Um, rest of the pen right there. I used to have it's go it's gone down a lot now. I used to have a big callus there from resting my pens there. Uh, even when I got into my first fountain pen in fourth grade, I continued it, and I'll tell you exactly why. In first grade, I was holding it wrong, just like this. And uh, instead of the teacher diplomatically su suggesting, well, why don't you try holding it like this? I was yelled at. And I even had my hand slapped. Not the rule or anything, but slapped. You know, this was the early 80s, and they could do that then. And with my personality, I mean, I know I'm usually very nice and bubbly and happy and joyous, but you really push me, and I will push back. And little seven-year-old me got pushed that day, and he pushed back. And he flat out refused to, even if my papers got held up as an example of how not to write. Even if I got called out on it in front of the class, it just made me double down on, I will write this way. And I continued until my 30s. It was in my mid-30s that I started getting into collecting fountain pens, and specifically the Noodlers. They didn't have the Conrad yet, but they had the Nib Creeper, and I was enjoying the Flex Nib, and I wanted to get more out of it and really make an effort to improve my handwriting. And that's when I made the effort to switch habits. And now it's actually difficult for me to hold it incorrectly. And it's just a habit to hold it correctly. See, my interest in writing better accomplished something that that teacher couldn't accomplish. Keep that in mind if you're a teacher. And uh, as far as the handwriting style, I was also looking at writing differently. I would guess, although several teachers had different styles through my elementary, some of them you have leading tails in your letters, some of them you don't, some of them you can't do curly cues, some of them you have to write your A this way, some this way, and you get in trouble if you don't write it the right way, even though we learned to write it a different way the year before. Um, but I would guess overall I was taught some version of the Palmer method. Now, uh, when I got out on my own, and in my, like I said, my mid-30s, and I started looking at it, I looked at... Spencerian specifically. I thought that's nice looking, but a little too ornate for my tastes. So I write with what I call simplified Spencerian. Now I just could not work myself through the exercise Spencerian exercises. I can't. It's so boring. But I made an effort to reshape my letters, especially capital letters. And just be more intentional about writing my curly cues. You know, some of the things you learn is write with your arm like this, not with your hand like this. Uh, you, you learn, I learned one trick for me, write with a broad nib every so often because it forces you to make all little hoops and loop-de-doodles bigger. And then they look really good when you're using a fine point nib. And then just practice. Now, I can't do that rote practice where I copy stuff down, but I can write letters, I can write my novel, I write notes, I write grocery lists. That's how I practice. So I suppose if I'm going to get good at Chinese writing, I'm just going to have to find things to write in Chinese because, yeah, copying characters just isn't doing it for me. I know that's how you learn, but I lose interest. 
I mean, it's fun learning the tones, learning the words, learning the interesting grammar, the particles. And, and then you get to the writing, you're just like, oh. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. So I would say, my, in short, my handwriting is my own cre combination of Palmer, Spencerian, and whatever letters and numbers I liked. Okay, the next question. This was really specific. Um, I was just looking to see if I have examples down here, but I do not. I have one, no, I have one example down here. That's it. My next question was about what should I use as my pen? The Twisby's Vex 700R, which is a new model I've never used, a Lamy 2000, or a Pilot Custom 823. So I'll just say this. I settled on the Lamy 2000. I have owned all three. I knew, no longer own the, the Twisby 700. I, I traded that for another pen. Uh, I still own the Pilot Custom 823 and I like it. But as far as daily writing, I prefer the Lamy 2000. It's more comfortable. Uh, it's one of those pens that just disappears in your hand and you write and you don't even think about what am I writing with you just write I uh, it's got a very simple form factor it's just about the writing not about aesthetics or anything like that uh, the filling mechanism is a straightforward piston you can't even really see the ink level except when it gets low through the ink windows I uh, with the other two, they're demonstrators, so you get captivated by the ink sloshing around. You also get captivated by the really cool filling mechanism, although they do hold a lot of ink. I will give them that. But I guess for me, it was the Lamy 2000, but some people don't like the ears. I don't even notice them, but some people don't like them. Those are what holds the cap on. Uh, some people don't like the tapered grip section. Again, doesn't bother me. So, uh, I, I just felt like the A23 was too pricey and showy. I don't know what the VAC 700R is like, but I know the VAC 700 had just... It was comfortable, but it had too much of a step up from the grip section to the barrel. And that annoyed me. And it just always felt not quite as solid as the other two pens, if that makes sense. So, hope that helps. I'm always uncomfortable recommending a specific pen to somebody because it's such an individual choice. What do you like? Um, size of your hand, how you grip pens, how you write. There's so many things that go into it. You know, I like my fountain pens, but I also really enjoy using a wood number two pencil. They're skinny. <laughs> okay. Um... This is a good question. It actually came up, I think it was on my uh, comments yesterday. Does good handwriting sell pens? Well, I'll just tell you what. I want you to imagine a shop which is messy, there's dust, uh, things are disorganized. Which can be kind of fun if it's an antique store or a used bookstore. But um, I'm thinking of a used bookstore I used to go to, which is... No longer there, so I think I'm safe talking about it. In Minot, North Dakota. Uh, and you'd walk in and it's like, oh my God, a bomb went off. Oh no, it's just the books aren't organized at all. I mean, laying on the floor, not even stacked, just piled in heaps. I think they had started organizing way, way back and had good intentions, put them on the shelves, but as the years went by, it just turned into a mess. Now up on the hill, which sadly also is no longer there, there was another used bookstore uh, had a bagel shop in it. The bagel shop is still there, but they got rid of the, the used bookstore part, which I was really sad about. But I don't live up there anymore, so I get to mine out like once every two or three years, so I guess whatever. Uh, but all the books were shelved. They were categorized within the categories. They're alphabetized by author. Now, guess which shop I went to all the time? It was the one that was very neat. The bomb went off store I was in twice. Bought a book each time probably, because I usually do. But never in a real hurry to go back. Because it was so hard to find anything. And it just gave me this claustrophobic, crowded feeling. And I didn't like it. Um, 
I used to go, and I don't even know if it's there anymore. It's probably been 20 years since I've been in the place. But I used to go to a used bookstore down in State College back when I lived in Pennsylvania. Uh, they started in what was an old house. Very, It was kind of crowded in there. But they had things reasonably categorized in different rooms and on two different floors. And they moved into a bigger facility that was more uh, modern, I guess. And it's still a used bookstore. Very easy to find the books, but I liked it. Um, guess what? And, and when you look at the marketing that Goulet Pens does, when they're trying to sell pens, they don't just blop, here's the pen. Although, the, you know, when you want close-ups of just a pen, you do that. But like on their blog, they'll have it on a notebook, laying strategically just so. Maybe we have uh, some random flower or art object just placed just so. And I'll tell you what they're doing. They're selling the pen. So absolutely, we judge by appearances. That's our first thing we see. When you meet somebody, you look at them and you judge by appearances. You look at me right now, I'm not shaved. I suppose I should have shaved before I did this video, but I didn't. Um, you judge me by that. If you would have seen me while I was out grocery shopping this afternoon, I had on my Carhartt, uh, it's winter jacket, which is uh, very threadbare and worn out with holes in it. And really needs to be replaced, as I discovered walking to work one day this week, when the wind was in a different direction. It was blown right into that hole. And wow, was that cold. So I'll probably have a new coat next winter. But anyway, you'll judge me based on that. You'll say, oh, we have a slob. Now, you see me teaching. I don't wear a shirt like this. I apologize, I don't know when that camera quit, but uh, you see me teaching, I don't wear a shirt like this, except on jeans day when this is a shirt I would wear, because I want to wear a button down, still look reasonably respectable. Um, it started because I felt like I looked too much like a kid back when I was 22. I mean, maybe I still look like a teenager, maybe a senior in high school now, but uh, you know, I'm not fool. I'm not worried so much about being mistaken for one of my students anymore but i always wear a dress shirt and a tie to work every day that's my thing and it's part of that distance and saying okay i am the teacher i have a position of authority uh i'm due a little bit more respect you call me mister not hey waski or whatever you know i have a, a name it's mister in my last name and you say the full last name, even though it's Polish and complicated. Figure out how, because I'm making the effort to learn your name and show you some respect in calling you, instead of calling you whatever is popping into my head right at the moment. Um, you know, it's, it's just part of that whole thing. I, it boggles my mind, and maybe it's a generational thing. I found out that younger teachers no longer show up for interviews wearing a jacket, a tie, a dress shirt, nice pants. Usually it's like nice pants and a good polo, possibly a dress shirt, but no tie, no jacket. It just boggles my mind. But then I'm older. Maybe I am starting to feel my age. I'm Generation X. But I just feel that you really do sell better when you present things nicely. Uh, so when you use nice handwriting, that makes the pen look better. Uh, if I now I write, I, I will admit uh, some of the quotes I write might be a little controversial, and I'll just say this: some of the quotes I write probably detract from the pen, because people say, "Oh, he's one of them people," for whatever reason. And uh, I'll just go with it. Some people might be looking at the bug splatter windshield that we're driving through, and judging me. I'm sorry, there's bugs. It's the Dakotas, and it's fall. <laughs> They're there. The car drives through them. But, yes, in short, I do think handwriting helps sell pens. Uh, just your feelings towards the reviewer or the retailer um, help sell pens. You know, if, if the reviewer is really annoying you, you're not going to have the warm fuzzies toward the pen that you might have if you really like the reviewer. Or you feel really welcomed by that reviewer. Or if the reviewer is really good looking, you might be more likely to pay attention than, you know, imagine me coming on, I do need a haircut, but, you know, hair shaggy, 
this outgrown, wearing my slappy shirt. Maybe I spilled coffee down the front of my shirt. You know, I'm just very unkempt. You're going to judge me differently. Am I a model? No, I'll never be able to model. I'm just an ordinary looking guy, but at least I make somewhat of an effort to look decent. I really should have shaved though before I filmed this, but whatever. I didn't. Sorry. So now you will take everything I've said with a grain of salt because of that. Grain of salt, not grain of assault. Sorry. All right. And then the last question I had, uh, this was a private message, was how do I pay for the pens? Well, let me tell you. If you're interested in something, you will find a way to pay for it. Some people, it's a nice car. Some people, it's snowmobiles. Some people, it's a nice house. A lot of people, it's a cell phone or the latest uh, gadgets. I have a couple of gadgets, but uh, I'm in it for the long haul with those gadgets. The laptop that I edit all this with is five years old. It's a nice laptop, but it's five years old. Uh, my iPad is... I can't remember how many years old. It's older than that anyway. It's it's the third version of iPad that came out. I can't even update the operating system anymore because it's so old. I do not own a cell phone. I do have a nice rotary dial phone. In fact, it's almost directly above that camera that you're watching me through right now. Uh, I do have a touchstone phone too, but it doesn't ring. So that's why the rotary dial phone is hooked up in the other room because that rings. And it's a small house, which, hey, I own one of the smallest houses in my town. That saved me a lot of money. I drive an 18-year-old car. That saves me a lot of money. I don't go clothes shopping very often. In fact, usually I have to buy a whole bunch of clothes all at once because suddenly I'm putting my arms through them as I'm getting dressed. You know, this is a popular place for me to destroy a shirt. Uh, same thing with the knee on my pants. Usually I destroy a whole bunch of clothes all at once and have to replace them all at once. Whereas if I maybe spread it out more, that wouldn't be so much of an issue. But yeah, I, I don't buy clothes. I don't have cable. I don't have satellite. I do have internet. Um, I don't have a nice TV. In fact, for years, I was using a, a very ancient 1970s, really super heavy television that somebody gave me when I started out on my own. Uh, and then one day the picture just quit working, so I got rid of it. And then I resorted to this 19-inch monitor for the next 12 years. Until I was dusting about a month before Christmas this year, knocked it off the bookshelf, and it wouldn't turn on anymore. So I do have a 32-inch monitor now to replace it, which is... No, sorry, 27-inch. 32 seemed too big. It's a 27-inch monitor that uh, suits my needs quite well. I'm perfectly content with old stuff. I uh, My furniture is 20-some years old, all of it. Uh, the couch, the bed, all could be replaced and need to be replaced, but don't have any plans for it now. I'm literally using storage bins with a tablecloth over them as one of my end tables. Uh, this studio, if you can't see it, but I have folding dinner, dinner trays here that I'm using. Uh, that's my desk upstairs is another one of them because it was a set of four I bought 20 some years ago. I'm sitting on a chair that's older than me that was in my father's kitchen when he was a little boy. Um, I have a, one, another one of those folding tables is my bed stand. You know, I, I, that's how I can afford it. And it doesn't hurt that I'm in my 40s and I'm single. Uh, when I'm dating, I definitely spend more money. And so uh, probably being single right at this moment is saving me a lot of money. And uh, don't have any kids, which I don't want any. So anybody who's looking for kids, I'm not your guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, that saves me a lot of money. So I just live cheaply. And, you know, it, it just, you know, not the teachers in North Dakota make a lot of money, but I, I don't spend a lot and uh, I don't have a lot of expenses, so... It works out. So that's how I can afford them all. Also, when you look at what I buy, yes, I have some very nice pens. The Aurora 88 is now the most expensive pen I own. But a lot of what I buy is used or cheap. So there is that. And I sometimes have some outside jobs where I make a little extra money. So that's how I pay for pens. I don't have the hobbies other people have. I don't have the snowmobile. I don't have the nice car. I, those aren't things of value. I don't do a lot of traveling. I'd like to. I just don't. 
So, uh, yeah, that's how I pay for it. So anyway, I uh, that's my very first Q&A session. Uh, I hope that you got something out of it and uh, something useful. So again, uh, if videos like this where I talk about fountain pens, both new and old, uh, at all price points, inks, paper, and so on interest you, please subscribe below. If something I said struck your fancy or you have another question or you'd like some more info, excuse me, some more information, please feel free to comment below. Uh, maybe I'll do this again sometime. We'll see. I'm looking down the road at doing a live stream with this. So uh, who knows where this will go. In the meantime, I thank you for watching. And we'll see you later. Bye-bye.